ladies and gentlemen. Today's session begins a new unit, one in which we will cover what was, up to this point in time anyway, the bloodiest and most devastating war in Western history. I am speaking, of course, about World War I, and today we'll look at how that war started. So let's go to the essential questions. The causes of World War I can really be broken down into four main themes, nationalism, imperialism, militarism, and alliance systems. And we'll examine how these four things, in concert, created the conditions in Europe that would lead to the start of the war. Uh, well, some event has to happen to set the whole thing off, doesn't it? So we will look at what event served as the spark that started the war, and how exactly did this event start the war? Then finally, we'll see how what should have been just a localized conflict between two countries, Austria and Serbia, how did that grow to become World War I, the war that would engulf all of Western Europe and beyond? So those are the essential questions, guys. That's where we are headed today. Thus, without further ado, let's go ahead and begin. Well, by the start of the 1900s, Europe really is that powder keg of political turmoil just waiting for the right spark to set it off. And as we mentioned earlier, there's four key factors that create these conditions in Europe. Nationalism, imperialism and European rivalries, militarism, and alliance systems. And so these things together create those conditions. We're going to examine each of those four here as we move forward. Now, let's start with nationalism. Okay, Nationalism, by definition, is kind of like having great pride in your nationality or your country. It's kind of like patriotism, as we would think of it. Nationalism often led to independence movements in countries under foreign domination. For example, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was a place that encompassed many different nationalities. And uh, the Slavic people who lived in the Balkan Peninsula, in the southern part of the Austria Hungarian Empire, they wanted independence from Austria-Hungary. They wanted to join with their neighbors, Serbia, who were also Slavic. And so those feelings of nationalism, Slavic nationalism in Austria, are one of the destabilizing forces uh, facing Europe during this time. Of course, nationalism also stoked already heated rivalries between the powerful nations of Europe. For example, there was a huge rivalry between the French and the Germans, and this one dates all the way back to the era of the Napoleonic Wars, and before that even. And the most recent manifestation of this rivalry was in 1870 when the French fought the Germans in the Franco-Prussian War, and it did not go too well for the French. Actually, it was an embarrassing defeat for the French. They were invaded by the Germans and defeated in six weeks. It was pretty bad. And ever since then, the French have been seething and looking for a reason to fight Germany and get revenge. So nationalism, major problems there. There's also a big rivalry between the British and the Germans. The British wants the you know unquestioned economic and, uh, and really political power uh, of Europe is now facing this growing rivaled threat from Germany. Germany is an economic industrial power themselves. Germany has the strongest army in Europe to rival Britain's great navy, so there is a big rivalry between those two. And related to what we mentioned earlier with Slavic nationalism, there's a big rivalry between the Austro-Hungarian Empire and their neighbor, Serbia. Because uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which has the Slavic uh, people who want to break away and gain their independence, uh, they want to join with Serbia, and Serbia is happy to help them out. Uh, the Serbians, who are also Slavic, have been helping the nationalist movements in uh, Austria by providing them with money, with training, and with weapons to really move their nationalistic ideas forward. So that doesn't really make for a good relationship between neighbors. So nationalism is a real destabilizing force that is threatening the unity of Europe during this time. Next, a second cause was imperialism. As countries became more and more industrialized, they were constantly seeking more lands as sources of raw materials and new markets to sell their industrial products. Imperialism, by the way, is when a stronger nation takes political, military, or economic control over a weaker nation. And uh, Europe's push for imperialistic gains is leading to intense rivalries between nations. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, the great powers of Europe are scrambling with each other to gain influence and control over different parts of Africa and Asia, looking to get their hands on the very lucrative raw materials uh, and the trade markets in those regions for, of course, their own economic and, uh, and political gain. Nations like England, France, Germany, Italy, and Belgium are all imperialistic. Oh, and the United States, too, by the way, but that's a whole other story. And so as these nations are competing with each other for territories in Africa uh, and Asia, the competition leads to hostility, which leads to conflict, and in some cases even wars between rivals nations. You've got rival nations in Europe squaring off on remote battlefields in Africa for control over remote areas where they could get natural resources or looking to fight over tiny islands in the Pacific for control over trade. So this is leading to even more increasing tensions between the powerful nations of Europe. 
Next is militarism. This is the third cause of World War I, and it's kind of a direct outgrowth of the imperialism angle. Militarism is the enthusiastic support for military strength and the desire to grow and increase your own military power. Imperialistic nations all know that they've got to have strong militaries to back up their imperialistic claims. You can't just go to another part of the world and hope to have control or influence and not have the muscle to back it up. Therefore, nations are spending more and more and more money on their militaries. They are increasing their military technology. They're building more, bigger weapons and increasing the number of soldiers in their armies. And this is kind of a scary thing for nations who are rivaled with other nations. I mean, as you see your enemies become more powerful, you need to become more powerful to keep up with them. For example, Germany has the strongest army in Europe, we already know. England has the strongest navy. Well, because of this militaristic buildup, we begin to see Germany expand their navy to keep up with the British, uh, and the British expanding their army to keep up with the Germans. England, France, Russia, Germany, they're all participating in this arms buildup. And as each nation strengthens its military, all the others feel threatened, and they do the same thing. I mean, look, think of it like this. Let's say that the Germans uh, invent a better rifle and start arming their guys with that so that they can shoot farther and more accurate in battle. Well, the French, feeling threatened by this, because remember the French arrived with the Germans, start adding a new, better heavy machine gun to their arsenal. What do the Germans do? They invent a bigger, better heavy machine gun and add it to their arsenal. Well, what are the French going to turn around and do? They're going to add an even bigger gun to their arsenal. What do the Germans have to do? You guessed it. An even bigger gun. And this military buildup just keeps going and going and going, and this game of military one-upsmanship continues until Europe reaches just this critical level of militarization. Yes, I know those are nukes in those pictures, and no, there are no nukes in World War I, but I think you get the picture that I'm trying to paint with this, that we're creating a level of militarization that is so great that we've got such incredible weapons that if we do fight, we can do absolutely horrible, breathtaking damage to each other. All right, the fourth cause of World War I is the development of alliance systems. And the alliance systems are formed in direct response to the growing militarism of Europe. Concerned with the growing powers of their enemies, nations began to make alliances in order to maintain the balance of power and protect themselves in the event of war. Maintaining the balance of power is all about preventing war. But of course, having allies is also about making sure you're protected if the war does happen. And uh, these alliance members all agreed to fight together if any one of them were attacked. This is designed to prevent war because the hope is that your enemy won't attack you if they know that all of your allies are going to back you up. That's kind of the idea there. And so by 1907, we've got two distinct alliance systems that have been created in Europe, two distinct sides that really are kind of squared off against one another, rivals against rivals. First, we have the Triple Alliance. Germany makes an alliance with Austria as a way of isolating Germany's enemy, France. These two are later joined by Italy. Italy, by this time, a relative newcomer to being a united country in Europe, is looking for strong friends. That's why they end up siding with Germany and Austria. On the other side, you have the Triple Entente. That's a French word. It means like friendly agreement. Of course, leave it to the French. France forms an alliance with Russia out of both countries' mutual fear of Germany. But it's not just about alliances, it's about military strategy. Because if you look at the map, look at the situation that Germany now finds itself in. Enemies on the east and the west, enemies on both sides. The French do this because they want the Germans to know if there's ever a war, we've got you surrounded. And if you ever fight us, you're going to have to fight Russia and potentially face a two-front war. Later, England will make separate alliances with both France and Russia, and so the three countries together form this triple entente, this friendly agreement, if you will. The members of these alliance systems all agree to support each other in the event that any of them gets attacked. So what we see is that any kind of conflict involving any of the member nations of an alliance system runs the risk of pulling everybody into the war. So here we are, 1907, Europe aligning itself into two opposing sides ready for war. And in the case of France and Germany, honestly, looking for reasons to fight each other in a war. The continent is now a powder keg that is ready to explode, and all that is needed is the spark. And that spark will be provided by nationalism. Nationalism in the Balkans will create the spark that's going to start World War I. If you remember, the Balkan Peninsula down here in what is the Austro-Hungarian Empire is home to the Slavic ethnic group in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Remember that the Slavs are incredibly unhappy. They want to break away from the Austrian Empire. They want to join their neighbor Serbia, where a lot of other Slavic people live. They want to create one united Slavic nation.
and that Slavic nationalism was especially strong in Bosnia. Serbia, of course, you know, they're happy to do this. Serbia supports this all Slavic country. They're anxious to absorb that territory. And as we know, they provided aid to the Slavic nationalist groups that were working against Austria, providing them with money, training, weapons for them to take part in their nationalist activities. And obviously that's not helping the relationship between Austria and Serbia at the time either. Well, on June 28th, 1914, the event will take place that will set in motion the start of World War I. June 28th, 1914, the Archduke Francis Ferdinand, the heir to the throne of the Austrian Empire, visited the city of Sarajevo in Bosnia. And he was doing this for two reasons. One, there were military maneuvers going on that he was observing as one of the leaders of Austria's military, but the other was sort of like a goodwill mission. As heir to the throne, he wanted to try to calm things down with the Slavic people by showing them, hey, I'm your buddy and things are going to be better when I'm in charge. What he doesn't realize, though, is that during his visit, there's a Slavic nationalist group down there in Sarajevo that plans to assassinate him. And while on a car ride through the, street, uh, the streets of the city of Sarajevo, the Archduke and his wife Sophie, there pictured with him, were assassinated by a member of a radical Slavic nationalist group. The gunman, 19-year-old Gavrilo Princip, with two squeezes of the trigger and the death of two individuals has inadvertently set in motion the chain of events that is now about to start World War I. Even though this assassination happened in Austrian territory, the Austrians blame Serbia for the killing. Because remember, we know that the Serbians supported these Slavic nationalist groups. And so blaming Serbia, the Austrians now want to punish Serbia. They see it as being their fault. But before they act, the Austrians want to make sure they have the backing of their strongest ally. Germany. Now, as it turns out, Germany's emperor, the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II, happened to be very close friends with the Archduke, and he was angered and saddened by the assassination of his friend uh, and wife. Uh, so the Kaiser was, you know, more than willing to give Austria any support that they needed to do whatever they had to do to get vengeance on those who had killed his friend. Uh, so knowing they had the backing of Germany, the Austrians issue an ultimatum to Serbia on July 23rd, 1914. Austria demands to be able to enter Serbia to investigate the assassination and suppress any and all radical nationalist groups. Basically, they want to enter a sovereign country and arrest that sovereign country's citizens. Clearly, no one is ever going to agree to this kind of ultimatum. And the Austrians know it. They're making an offer they know Serbia cannot accept because it gives them the pretext for war and the punishment they want to lay down upon Serbia. So as you would expect, uh, two days later, the Serbians reject Austria's ultimatum. Three days after that, on July 28th, Austria officially declares war against Serbia. The declaration of war between Austria and Serbia is going to set off a chain of events that's about to pull all of Europe into the conflict. You remember those alliance systems we talked about? They're all about to come into play. As it turns out, Russia actually has a secret alliance with Serbia. Yeah, we didn't know about that yet. That's because it was a secret. So in response to Austria's actions, Russia mobilizes their army against Austria. Now, due to the alliance between Austria and Germany, Germany then mobilizes their army against Russia. In accordance with their alliance with Russia, the French now mobilize their army against Germany. And everyone is sort of in this, you know, stare down standoff, thinking that the other side is going to back down. But as it turns out, nobody backs down. And so Austria declaring war on Serbia leads Russia to declare war on Austria, which leads Germany to declare war on Russia, which leads France and Germany to declare war on each other. And then when Germany tries to invade France, they go through neutral Belgium, and Britain's drawn into the conflict, declaring war on Germany, and Germany declares war on Britain. And you all of a sudden have what should have been just two nations fighting it out, becoming an epic battle royal in Europe. By August of 1914, Germany... Austria and their new ally, the Ottoman Empire, are at war with France, Russia, and Britain. Hey, wait a minute, what about Italy? Oh, that's right, Italy declined to enter the conflict on the side of Germany and Austria uh, because they said Germany and Austria were the aggressors and not being attacked. Oh, and when Italy does enter the war, they're actually going to enter on the other side with France and Britain. Yeah, some allies there, right? So what began as a local dispute between Austria and Serbia has now ballooned into a conflict that is engulfing nearly all of Europe. 
All right, guys, so we saw that World War I began because of those four causes. Nationalism, imperialism, militarism, and the alliance systems created the conditions that started the war. We saw that the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand by Slavic nationalists created the spark that set the whole thing off, and those alliance systems pulled everybody into the conflict, creating a larger European war. So those are the essential questions. That's what we covered today. Be ready to talk about that the next time that we meet. And as always, until that time, I bid you farewell.